to see positive change in our institutions and organizations. They're supported by amazing professionals who work diligently, guided by the belief in the justice of their work and the Jewish, and the Jewish principle that we are all created in God's image. But that's not enough. By coming he together here, we're making a shared commitment to reach beyond this first circle. Focusing on disabilities and special needs as a special interest alone leaves us all the poorer. This is a justice issue. It's a Jewish issue, and it's all of our issue. That's a lesson I learned from my father, and I'd like to get, dedicate this conference and the work we do here today to his memory. When Mort Ruderman, Zichron Levracha, started his work as a funder, he wasn't with the goal of creating a 125-person annual conference. He wasn't concerned with bringing together leading funders and experts. He just saw injustices in the world and felt called to act, to do something. He believed that as Jews, we have an obligation to improve the lives of those in need in our society. Building on his legacy, his desire to leave the world stronger, more righteous, motivates me every day and inspires what we've gathered here to accomplish. To further our vital mission as a foundation, I would like to announce today that we have created the Ruderman Prize in Disability. We will seek out from across the globe the most innovative programs which include people with disabilities in our communities and we will recognize them with the Ruderman Prize in Disability and a cash award. We've allocated $200,000 for prizes and will award up to, ten, up to 10 innovative projects. For more information on this program, I direct you to our foundation's website. It is our hope that this award program will help shine a light on the inclusion of people with disabilities in our Jewish community around the world. At today's advanced conference, we'll continue the work we started at last year's advanced conference, which led to the creation of the Disability Peer Network, with 16 funders who have begun to search for common goals to make our community more inclusive and to use our collective influence to change the face of society. Too often, funders work alone in, si in silos when funding excellent programs to help improve the lives of people with disabilities in our community. However, this issue is so large and so complex that none of us can seriously alone hope to create real change. That is why this peer network incubated at JFN was begun. I urge my fellow funders to set out in search of our common passion and work together to create real impact in our community. Please see Ru Ruthie Rottenberg, who I believe is here, the network's new director, to learn how you can join our effort. I hope that one day soon our community will reach the level of inclusion that will make this gathering unnecessary. In this room and in breakout sessions, we'll learn from each other about the unique challenges of this field and how we can work together to strengthen our impact. In-depth sessions will help us become better funders, giving us an opportunity to learn from each other, to share our expertise and experience on so many issues that are critically important to this field. Throughout today, we'll hear from funders who are making a difference, from scholars and experts, from individuals with disabilities too. Together, we'll build the foundation for a stronger community. We're here to increase the prominence and prioritization of disability and special needs funding on the communal agenda. In our camps and schools, in formal settings, in international organizations, we'll work to make sure that they are not just overlooked, but an integral part of the conversation. We'll strive to create a shared set of priorities and goals for our community's disability work. And we'll commit to reaching beyond this room to sharing the message of inclusion and the importance of this work with our peers and colleagues around the world. There is so much to do and so much to learn, but by coming together, we've already begun the work. We are also joined today by advocates for those with disabilities who've worked so hard over many years to create a more level playing field for those who, who, and who bring their experience, talent, and wisdom to inspire us today. We're so pleased to have as a keynote speaker, Academy Award-winning actress and longtime disability advocate, Marley Matlin, who has proven that disability knows no bounds. We're equally pleased to welcome Tim Shriver, the CEO of Special Olympics. Like many of us, Tim comes from a family with a long tradition of philanthropy and service, representing the third generation of his family's philanthropy. In his work on advocacy alongside people with disabilities, he continues his family's legacy of not being satisfied with the status quo but working tirelessly to make real change. This tradition of door to door from generation to generation guides us and inspires us. As we sit and learn from each other today, let's remain focused on not just where we're coming from, but where together we can take the community. 
is our hope this conference will inspire, teach, and provide the networking necessary for Jewish funders to begin to build our community into the kind of inclusive community we all deserve, the kind of Jewish community that we are meant to be. Now I'd like to welcome my friend Don Weinberg, president of the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation and host of today's conference to share what we have achieved over the last year. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Just one correction so we don't upset the real president of the Weinberg Foundation. I'm just the chairman. Okay, but thank you for the pro promotion. Last year with Jay's leadership and for the first time, we came together with a simple idea. Bring together funders from the Jewish community who are interested in disabilities and special needs and see what happens. From that basic vision, we've grown into a 175-person conference with not just many returning participants from last year, but more than 50 new faces as well. In fact, if you weren't at last year's conference, could you just raise your hand just to get an idea? Oh, seems like you're almost the majority. We launched a new peer network for funders of Jewish special needs and disabilities, and 17 funders have made a two-year commitment of substantial investments to map the field, understand current funding, and get an in-depth sense of the needs we're facing. We've hired a full-time director of the network, Ruthie Rothenberg. And would you raise your hand, Ruthie? Way back there. She, she's the new full-time director. She brings a background in both special needs, special ed, and Jewish philanthropy. From her position at the Jewish Funders Network, Ruthie will help as we build a network of funders who fund across the spectrum around the world in this area. We'll continue to strengthen our network of funders dedicated to moving the issue to the top of the Jewish agenda, dedicated to sharing and learning from each other and the field to help improve their grants and grantees, and dedicated to making our community more inclusive. So, in our conversations and sessions today, if you were here last year, I want to invite something a little out of the ordinary for many of us maybe even a little uncomfortable. Show off, brag a little, share what you've done this past year as a result of last year's conference. Who have you connected with? What partnerships have you made? What new ideas or projects have been grown from the seeds we planted? And for all of us, what more can we do? What needs are out there and who can we connect with to meet them? Let's take advantage of the unique opportunity this conference presents and start to plan bigger and better things for the future. We have a strong program and a packed schedule today, and I don't want to delay too long, but let me share a few housekeeping announcements before we welcome our first presenters this morning. First, this is a Jewish conference. We fed you breakfast this morning. Lunch is at 12.15. And don't worry, there will be snacks available between sessions this afternoon. We wouldn't want anyone here to go hungry. Eat! Second, and there's a note to this effect in the conference program as well, our plenary sessions in this room are being webcast to a broader audience. While so much of the work at this conference is done in the smaller breakout sessions. We wanted to be sure that our friends and colleagues who couldn't join us today were able to hear these inspirational and educational messages from our major speakers. Third, to help prepare a detailed conference report, JFN is recording the breakout sessions for its own internal use, so be careful what you say. Only official presenters listed in the program will be quoted. And no participant names will be disclosed, but we wanted to alert you in any case. Fourth, there are working members of the media here as well. They all have easily visible identifying ribbons on their badges, and they are under similar guidance. No identifying participants, no quoting without permission. That said, 
They are here to tell a great story about the importance of disabilities in the Jewish community, and I'd encourage you all to take a moment to share your experiences with them if that's what you prefer to do. If you have questions or concerns, feel free to speak to JFN's communications director. Raise your hand back there. Communications director. Finally, we're fortunate to be at Baruch College and throughout the day in our plenary sessions will be joined by some students in their Disabilities Services Department. This is a great opportunity to share our speakers and our message with our hosts, and we're happy to welcome them. Now I'd like to welcome Ronit Fishman Ophir. Ronit is a partner in the Fishman Group in Israel and heads its corporate social responsibility efforts. She's been a leader in promoting the integration of people with disabilities into society and is here to share an update on the great work being done in this field by our, our network of funders in Israel. Please welcome Ronit. Hello. Um, my name is Ronit Fishman. I will speak in Hebrew. Shlomit from the Harrison Foundation will help me. So uh, it will be another uh, uh, partnership to, to check how we do, how we do it. <laughs> okay, we are going to tell you about uh, what we're doing uh, in Israel. Um, Not this. Oh. Okay. okay, you can. Here? Okay. okay. Um, so who we are? Um, we are working now together the Ted Harrison Family Foundation, the Ruderman Family Foundation, and the Fishman Group. Um, uh, those. Okay. I start in English, I will change to it Hebrew. שלושה שותפים שיצאנו לדרך בפרויקט שאנחנו נדבר עליו בהמשך. תוצאה של שולחן שה-JFN התחיל בישראל. אנחנו בתחילת תהליך, אנחנו מקווים ונשמח שעוד בעיקר קרנות ישראליות יצטרפו אלינו. So I'll continue what Runit started. We began as a round table with a few uh, funders, and uh, we hope that in the future uh, we will be joined by uh, Israeli philanthropists in trying to promote the issue of disabilities in Israel. And uh, Runit, continue. Okay, the challenges that stood in front of us. Um, הגענו לקבוצה uh, מרכזית שיכולה להמשיך ולעבוד ביחד. הצלחנו להרים פרויקט משותף תוך כדי שמירה על העצמאות והייחודיות של כל ארגון. Uh, חיפשנו ומצאנו רעיון פרויקט שמנצל את היכולות והמשאבים השונים, מכיוון שאנחנו גם קרנות וגם תאגיד עסקי, uh, ראינו שבעצם אנחנו שונים, ולכל אחד מאיתנו יש, יכול להביא משאבים אחרים, והחלטנו שאנחנו רוצים לצאת לדרך ולנצל לטובה כל אחד שיביא מהבית את מה שהוא יכול לעשות טוב יותר. חשוב לי להדגיש שאנחנו, שוב, אנחנו גופים שונים, אנחנו כן מתעסקים בנושא של אנשים עם מוגבלויות, אבל כל אחד בא קצת מכיוון אחר. חלק מתעסקים בפריפריות, חלק מתעסקים את זה כתאגיד שאנחנו מתעסקים. באים בעצם מהצד של התאגיד, חלק עובדים בכל הארץ, חלק עובדים רק במקומות אחרים. זה השילוב והחיבור של כמה גופים שבאים ממקומות שונים להחליט בואו נעשה ביחד כדי לעשות משהו יותר גדול, זה בעצם מה שאנחנו עשינו פה. Okay. So, working together and overcoming our differences, that was a challenge, uh, a big challenge for us. As Ronit stated, there were two foundations and a business, the uh, Fishman Group, 
both we share the same uh, um, interest in promoting disabilities in Israel, but from different uh, aspects. So that was part of our, uh, I think, debating and overcoming our differences while keeping our independence as philanthropists and as a business. Okay. Actually, the, the description, a short description of our journey. עכשיו אנחנו בעצם נלך אחורה, בעצם איך התחלנו, ממש מההתחלה. Going backwards from, uh, from the beginning. התיישבנו מספר קרנות אמריקאיות וישראליות שמטפלות בנושא של אנשים עם מוגבלויות בישראל. שוב, ה-JFN בעצם התחיל את כל המהלך הזה. אני חייבת לציין שאנחנו כקבוצת פישמן לא עבדנו לפני זה עם ה-JFN. בעצם ה-JFN פנו אלינו ידעו שאנחנו מטפלים בנושא ואמרו לנו בואו תצטרפו לשולחן. זה לקח לנו הרבה זמן, לקח לנו אה, שבעה חודשים, הרבה מפגשים. שוב, חשוב לי להדגיש את זה, זה הרבה זמן, תהליך, בהתחלה התיישבנו, העלינו דברים, כל אחד בא ממקום אחר, חיפשנו נושא, חלק לא היו שלמים עם הנושא, חלק פחות התאים להם, חלק יותר התאים להם. כל אחד בא ממקום אחר, עד שבאמת התגבשנו, מצאנו נושא, חלק פרשו בדרך, אבל עדיין רוצים להיות חלק מהשולחן בנושאים אחרים. אמרנו, בואו ניקח, נתחיל. בעצם השולחן נתן לנו כגוף עסקי, אמר לנו, חבר'ה, מכיוון שאתם קצת יותר עושים את העבודה של, של בניית הפרויקט, צאו לדרך, תתחילו, תביאו משהו. ועכשיו, שלושה חודשים בעצם אחרי שאנחנו מתחילים, אנחנו כבר מתחילים לראות שאנחנו בונים פרויקט, שיש פרויקט שהוא הולך לצאת לדרך עם חששות, חשוב לי להגיד, אנחנו לא יודעים אם אנחנו נצליח במאה אחוז, אבל סוף סוף אנחנו התגבשנו ואנחנו יוצאים לדרך עם הפרויקט. many sessions, many meetings to try and uh, come to an agreement with a topic that we want to uh, try and uh, work together as funders. Um, and I want to stress, and we need to stress it, it's, it's a long process. It takes a lot of uh, uh, patience, tolerance, and uh, respect to each other's be to each other because we, for example, Ted Arison Family Foundation has been granting in Israel over 20 years in the field of philanthropy in disabilities and the Fishman Group also, but they have, we have never collaborated. And uh, the initiation of um, the Ruderman Family Foundation to gather uh, the foundations that uh, do grant in Israel in the field of disabilities was a first for everyone. And it's a process, and we discussed that yesterday in a meeting, that um, you can't push the process too, uh, too much. You have to give it time. You have to give the, uh, the uh, people around the table the respect to uh, preserve their independence in this field. Uh, if it's the business, if it's the, uh, if it's the philanthropy, if it's a private funder, family foundation. So this process took us about seven months, many learning sessions, up to the point that we did agree on a topic that we all found it comfortable and resonated with our uh, mission, with our guidelines as um, in the field of disability. אז מה אנחנו בעצם הולכים לעשות? החלטנו לקחת נושא שאני חושבת, אנחנו בכל זאת בקבוצת פישמן עוד לא התעסקנו בו, מכיוון שהוא גדול והוא איפשהו עומד למעלה מעל העבודה היומיומית שלנו, ואני מתארת לעצמי שגם הקרנות שהצטרפו אלינו, ואני מקווה שיצטרפו אלינו. החלטנו לטפל בנושא המודעות והסובלנות של האוכלוסייה בישראל ושל הרשויות בישראל, ובעצם של כל מי שנמצא בישראל כלפי אנשים עם מוגבלויות, ואנחנו בהמשך נגיד איך אנחנו עושים את זה. So, the uh, topic that we agreed to uh, launch is really to raise awareness in uh, the public uh, in Israel 
government, communities, uh, the society in Israel, and uh, it's something that is bigger than all the other uh, projects that we fund, and that's the only uh, way I think that we can hopefully, we don't know, we're not sure, but hopefully we believe that it can be a successful uh, uh, campaign that we're trying to launch. אז בעצם מה אנחנו עושים? אנחנו החלטנו אה, להרים מדד, או יש כאלה שאפילו, אנחנו לא סגורים על השם, יש אפילו אומרים זה בעצם דוח, ואפשר לקרוא לזה בהרבה שמות אחרים, אה, אשר אה, בודק את הסובלנות של האנשים, את הסובלנות והמודעות של האנשים בישראל אה, כלפי אנשים עם מוגבלויות. אה, מדד אשר הרעיון הוא בעצם לא דוח ולא מדד למגירה. אלא בעצם שאנחנו נצא עם קמפיין אה, על מנת, קמפיין אשר יוצא החוצה, אה, אנחנו בעצם אנחנו בודקים את זה לפי אזורים בישראל, רשויות, ערים. אה, צירפנו אה, את גלובס, שזה העיתון הכלכלי הגדול בישראל, שהוא בעצם שותף שלנו לעשייה, והוא בעצם יפרסם את הכל ויוביל את הנושא הזה. אה, לקחנו... אה, משרד אשר עוזר לנו בכל הנושא התקשורתי ומייעץ לנו, אנחנו מקווים לא להישאר עם גלובס, אלא בעצם שכאשר אנחנו נפרסם את זה, זה בעצם יצא החוצה וכל התקשורת בעצם תטפל בנושא הזה בעקבות המדד. אנחנו נתקשר עם גוף אקדמ... אקדמי חוקר, שבעצם הוא יעשה לנו את העבודה, ובעצם הרעיון הוא מדד שנתי, שיגרום... לכל האוכלוסייה בישראל בעצם להסתכל על עצמה ולראות איפה היא נמצאת יחסית למקומות אחרים בישראל, באיך שהיא מתייחסת לאנשים עם מוגבלויות. זה אמור להיות מדד שנתי, שבעצם כל שנה אנחנו נבדוק ואנחנו נראה לטובה או לרעה אם המקומות השתפרו או לא, ועל ידי ככה ליצור שינוי. אוקיי. Okay. So what we agreed was to try and develop uh, a tool, but we're not sure if we're going to define it as a tool, as a social index, uh, we're not sure. To try and see um, what happens in Israel in, uh, I can say already, right, 50, uh, 50 cities in Israel, what's going to happen on a yearly basis if the uh, community, governments, municipalities, are developing or changing their, uh, their um, awareness <laughs> towards a uh, population with disabilities. It's going to be um, campaigned by uh, a leading um, uh, newspaper in Israel, Globes, and hopefully other um, uh, communication um, TV and other papers will join. and. Uh, We'll spread the, uh, the awareness uh, index, the tolerance, the inclusion. It's a new thing in Israel. It has not uh, occurred in the past. And um, it's going to be publicized. It's not going to be uh, put on a shelf. It's going to be researched by an acad academic institution. We have not chosen yet. But the, uh, the main point is to really try and uh, make people aware אז כמו ששלומית אמרה, אנחנו ניקח 50 ערים או רשויות או יישובים, לאו דווקא ערים גדולות, חשוב לנו גם לבדוק יישובים קטנים במדינת ישראל ולמדוד ולראות איפה הם עומדים. שוב חשוב לי להגיד לא רק איך הרשות מתייחסת, אנחנו נבדוק כמובן שירותים, נגישות ודברים כאלה, אבל גם חשוב לנו לבדוק איך האוכלוסייה באותה רשות או עיר מתייחסת לאנשים. עם מוגבלויות. חשוב לנו לבדוק אם ערים מוכנות לקבל מבנים ושירותים שניתנים לאנשים עם מוגבלויות בשכונה שלהם, בחצר שלהם, או שהן אומרות הכל טוב ויפה, אנחנו מוכנות לתת כסף, אבל שלא יהיו אצלנו, שיהיו אצל השכנים שלנו. אנחנו, כמובן, מכיוון שאנחנו מתחילים, אנחנו נרחיב על כשלוש-חמש ערים יותר ונבדוק לעומק מה קורה שם. כאשר שוב אנחנו 
נפתח את זה לכל מה שקורה עם האנשים עם מוגבלויות, כי יכול להיות מצב שבעצם עיר היא כן נגישה, אבל אה, בכל זאת אנשים עם מוגבלויות מרגישים פחות נוח לגור בה. שוב, חשוב לנו להגיד, גם בכיוון שיש שוני בתקציבים של רשויות וערים שונות, אנחנו חשוב לנו לבדוק את הכל, ולא רק לפי תקציבים, כי כמובן לעיר שיש לה תקציבים הרבה יותר גדולים, הרבה יותר קל לה לעשות מאשר רשות או עיר ש... שיש לה תקציבים יותר קטנים. הרעיון בעצם בא, אנחנו, בעצם אנחנו רוצים לדרג בסופו של דבר את החמישים ערים במדינת ישראל, שזה גם חשוב לנו תקשורתית, כי אנשים בכל אופן בישראל אוהבים להסתכל איפה הם נמצאים בדירוג ומשווים את עצמם לשכנים שלהם ולערים אחרות, לראות איפה הם נמצאים לעומתם. על ידי כך לגרום לערים והרשויות שעושות פחות, להתחיל לעשות יותר ולתת להם את האפשרות על ידי הדירוג השנתי שהתפרסם שנה אחר כך ואולי יגרום להם להתחיל לעשות כדי להגיע למקום יותר טוב. So 50, uh, The purpose is really to try and measure and to rate the cities that are uh, uh, more inclusive, have more awareness, bearing in mind that there are small uh, cities, maybe in municipalities that are poor in budget, and sometimes the, uh, the municipality or the city or the town is very accessible in one hand, but uh, people with disabilities don't feel comfortable to live there. We, um, we want to really try and measure and rate those cities in order to uh, have those cities the following year try to improve uh, their position. Uh, so that is, I believe, in a nutshell what you sort of uh, try to uh, explain. ורק דבר אחרון, אנחנו מקווים שאנחנו נצא לדרך תוך מספר חודשים, שאנחנו נפרסם את המדד או הדוח הראשון שלנו. זה שוב, זה לוקח זמן עם גוף אקדמאי וזה לוקח הרבה זמן. מה שחשוב לנו בעצם להגיד שאנחנו חושבים שזה must במצב שאנחנו נמצאים היום, גם בישראל, אני מתארת לעצמי שגם בארצות הברית, למרות שנראה לי שבישראל זה קצת יותר קל, כי אצלנו בכל זאת אפשר לקחת את האוטו, לנסוע חצי שעה וכולם נפגשים, פה זה קצת שונה, אבל אם אנחנו רוצים להתחיל לעשות דברים יותר גדולים ויותר משפיעים, אנחנו חושבים שזאת הדרך היחידה, והכי חשוב זה סבלנות. <laughs> okay, so we hope that in a couple of months we will launch this campaign. Uh, it's a bit easier, um, I believe, in Israel. Geographically, it takes about, let's say, an hour to, to gather, maybe two. Um, but still, I, uh, I want to emphasize, and I think that that is one thing that all of us uh, Uh, shared and took from the round table is patience, patience, patience. It takes time to really reach uh, a decision and to feel comfortable that this is what we want to try. We are very optimistic, but we are also very cautious and we want to be very uh, um, professional in what we do in the sense of uh, picking you know, the right institution uh, for the research and working slowly, pace by pace, because the issue, and I think that is what kept us going, we all care about the issue of disabilities. Uh, although there were many differences between us, but the main thing that kept us going was the issue of disabilities and our belief that that is what we want to uh, try and change uh, in Israel. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Alexis Kasher, President of the Jewish Deaf Resource Center. Thank you. 
what a special honor it is to be here. And thank you to Jay Ruderman and David Azer. I'm okay now? We're okay? Okay. The interpreters tend to sit facing me and watch me sign. That's how we do it in the deaf community. I just want to make sure you can hear me. No. Is the microphone on now? No. Test with this one. No. Sorry, everybody. Hold on. And test. Okay, so I'm good to go? Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay. Thank you, Jay Ruderman, David Azer, and the Jewish Funders Network for the opportunity to speak to this very special group of people. The only conference of its kind where the focus is on how we Jews can support full inclusion in our community. Specifically, I would like to honor the memory of James' father, Morton Ruderman, Zichron Livracha, may his memory be for a blessing, for making this conference happen. In last week's Torah portion, Jacob woke up one morning after a dream and took a stone that he had slept on and he set it up as a monument to honor God. And there's a rabbinic midrash, a rabbinic story, that asks the question, why is this passage of the Torah first mentioning several stones and then only speaks of one stone that Jacob slept on? The rabbis decide that the reason why many stones got changed to one stone is because the stones were arguing with each other like children. The stones argued amongst themselves about which one would have the honor of becoming Jacob's pillow that night. And as a result of that argument, the stones fused together and became one stone. One, one stone. One look at the Jewish community, and we can see how we can easily be divided, arguing over our specific programs, losing out on the collective power we have to change the culture. I believe that the sacred work we are doing today will not only unify us, but will honor the memory of Morton Ruderman, who is responsible for bringing us all to the same table. And now I'd like to quote from Rabbi Jim Agolf, who said, oh, by, do you have a Kleenex? Okay, I'll just keep going. So as Rabbi Jim Agolf said, quote, thank you. Our ancient rabbis wanted to remind us that while we need to have definitions and boundaries, we must also remember to unite when a higher purpose calls upon us. Thank you. Let us never imagine that we are so inflexible or uncompromising as to allow ourselves to ignore the sacred summonses in our lives when our ultimate goal is to be in service of a holy purpose, then even the unimaginable can happen. Hostile rocks can become a welcoming place where the righteous can find the peace of sleep. For 4,000 years, the deaf and hard of hearing were not considered equals in the eyes of conservative Jewish law. That all changed last May when one rabbi, with the support of the deaf and hearing, hard of hearing community, wrote a conservative Jewish legal responsa that says 
that we are all equal regardless of whether we are deaf or not. This rabbi went further and showed that sign language should be recognized under the eyes of conservative Jewish law as being equal to spoken language for the purpose of praying. The status of sign language as a true language was proven over 50 years ago by an American linguist who showed that sign language was as functional and powerful as any spoken language in the world. Even though this proof happened 50 years ago, it took a collaboration between the deaf and hard of hearing community and the rabbinical community, as well as the bridging organizations that made it possible for Jewish law to accommodate the true abilities of deaf and hard of hearing Jews. Only now, after this change, am I finally considered a fully capable Jew on equal footing with my 14-year-old hearing daughter. I was fortunate enough to be born to deaf parents as well as have deaf grandparents. As a result, I had full access to language and communication from day one. As both of my parents are sign language users, my sister, on the other hand, is hearing. And she was the odd one out, even though she was a sign language user, because she was still the only hearing member of my immediate family. Because we deaf members had no access to Jewish communal life, she was also excluded. We, of course, observed holidays on our own, but we were not able to participate in the wider Jewish community. I was born in New York. My family and I moved to Texas when I was 11. Communication access during my education setting was a challenge until high school. But in high school, when a sign language interpreter was provided for the first time, it made the education environment fully accessible to me. That changed my life. And I became active with student government and a multitude of other student organizations. From there, I found my calling to become a civil rights and special education lawyer. It was in college at the University of Texas where I reconnected with my Jewish roots by joining a Jewish sorority. I continued my education at law school at the University of Texas where I met my husband who is hearing. After law school, he and I relocated to Los Angeles to begin our law careers and our family. The American with Disabilities Act had just been passed and I was fortunate to be on the front lines of the disability rights movement. As a newly minted attorney, I litigated a multitude of fascinating cases including one that ultimately required all, all the call boxes on the sides of the Los Angeles freeways to be accessible to people who are wheelchair users, as well as those who are deaf or hard of hearing. One of the plaintiffs in this case was a woman whose car broke down on the side of one of LA's busiest freeways. She was also a wheelchair user. Unfortunately, the shoulder of the freeway was too narrow for her to use her wheelchair. So she ended up getting out of her car and crawling to go to the call box. When she got to the call box, she had to pull herself up because of the height of the call box equipment, only to find out that the box was broken. Needless to say, she was stranded. The case was litigated over a few years until my opposing counsel discovered that his newly born son is deaf. The case settled shortly thereafter. Not only that, but he sought out counsel from my firm as to how to best educate his deaf son. This practice prepared me for my role as a Jewish mother and now as the president of the Jewish Deaf Resource Center. While I had access to my secular life and career, every time I wanted to do something Jewish with my family, 
I was made to feel like a beggar. When the time came for my oldest daughter to have a bat mitzvah, I found myself struggling with how to create a truly accessible Jewish home and communal life for my family. Through my partnership with various Jewish organizations, including the Jewish Deaf Resource Center and UJA Federation of New York, that access is changing. I'm no longer satisfied with minimal access, but true access where inclusion is embedded throughout the Jewish world, allowing not only myself, but my children and future generations to have access. The reality is, if I do not have access, my children also lose out on a rich and meaningful Jewish life. And ironically, now that I am involved in Jewish communal life, I am responsible for bringing back my hearing sister and her family. My sister, who felt rejected by the Jewish community, realizes now that as a mother, she needs the community support to give her two hearing girls the opportunity to experience the beauty and spirit of Jewish life. Those two girls can carry this into future generations. And this is one family we can serve right now instead of putting her grandchildren on the Jewish community's future outreach list. We want to live in a world where universal design and equal access is part of our culture. This includes the Jewish community. Being on par with everyone will allow us to live full and rich Jewish lives. But for this to happen, we must work together to change the wider Jewish community's understanding about who we are. And it will not happen without partnerships among individuals, organizations, funders, Jewish professionals, and lay leaders all working together to make this a part of our daily Jewish work. People with different abilities are a large untapped market to the buyers of goods, community leaders, advocates, teachers, role models. In my work as a civil rights attorney and advocate, I work with various organizations and businesses to help promote culture change from the inside out. For example, PepsiCo, through its diversity outreach program, has identified 1.1 billion potential customers with different abilities. This is almost equivalent to the population of China. PepsiCo has begun massive outreach efforts to serve this untapped population. This number does not even include the caregiver market, which has been identified as two billion. We are not going away. In fact, we are growing. It is up to us to take this concept of changing our cultural thinking so that the wider Jewish community can embrace each and every one of us then the Jewish community can truly be a role model for others and a light unto the nations. Now, back to our story about Jacob. In this week's Torah portion, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel, which means to struggle. So no one said that our work would be easy or that unity would come easily. But at the same time, our people's name means that we would struggle with each other and with God for the greater good. Let's do it together. May it be God's will. I am truly honored to introduce the next speaker, who happens to be one of my dearest friends, Marley Matlin. She is an incredible inspiration for all she has done and stands for. I just can't begin to tell you what an inspiration she is to me. 
and to the rest of the world. Marley began her professional career by receiving worldwide critical acclaim for her film debut in Children of a Lesser God, for which she received, you all know, the Academy Award for Best Actress. At 21, she became the youngest actress to receive a Best Actress Oscar, Oscar and only one of four to be the recipient. In addition to the Oscar, she received the Golden Globe Award for Best Actress in a Drama. She went on to star in several TV series of her own and an endless list of TV and movie roles and continues to raise the ceiling for women, actors, and people with different abilities, not only in movies and television, but with her far-reaching abilities, such as on ABC's Dancing with the Stars, and again, as a finalist on NBC's Celebrity Apprentice, raising a record $1 million, $1 million for a charity in a one day, in one day. And it was filmed right here in New York. Marley continues to awe us in all her cap capacity as a longtime champion for social justice. Through the years, Marley has helped raise awareness for better hearing health for millions of deaf and hard of hearing children and adults in developing countries, supporting the Starkey Hearing Foundation. And she was instrumental in getting several landmark legislation passed in support of closed captioning from which we all benefit. Marley currently serves as the national celebrity spokesperson for the American Red Cross. She also serves on the boards of a number of charitable organizations, including Easter Seals. She has received numerous awards for her charity work and was chosen as America Online's Chief Everything Officer. <laughs> on top of everything else, Marley also authored three novels for children, which are my kids' favorite books. One is Nobody's Perfect. In 2009, she published her New York Times best-selling autobiography, I'll Scream Later. She is quite a woman and role model for us all. Please welcome Marley Matlin. Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning to all of you. I'm glad that the microphone has been taken care of because I don't need it. <laughs> this is my interpreter that you hear, Jack Jason. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alexis, for that lovely and beautiful introduction. Thank you, my dear. Your remarks before mine were very inspiring to me, and you know how I feel about you. I really, really do look up to this woman here. She is everything. She is a beautiful, intelligent, and devoted friend to me and to many of us and all of us in the deaf community. We really, really do appreciate her. We just love her. We just love her. We really do. Well, it's good to be back in New York City but this time not having to run around to compete crazy tasks with an odd bunch, including a country singer, a 70s rocker, and an Atlanta housewife. <laughs> but I must say that my stint on Celebrity Apprentice, as you heard, was ultimately rewarding because the opportunity to raise a million dollars in one day on behalf of deaf children and adults in developing countries was one that I will never forget. More importantly, the opportunity to raise awareness on behalf of deaf children around the world who are often invisible or ignored was immeasurable. 
I must say that your warmth and hospitality this morning is humbling, but then that's no surprise because as Jews, no matter where we are in the world, no matter how far away from home we are, we have the unique talent, and it is definitely in our DNA, to make each other feel at home. And I call it living a life generously. It's what my parents and family and friends did for me growing up as a deaf Jewish young woman in Chicago. It's what we all do on behalf of Jews both here in the United States and for Jews around the world. We are mishpocha. We are family. It is this philosophy of family, of living a life generously that has allowed me to defy expectations and be the Jewish woman, actress, activist, and mother that I am. And today, the world is in desperate need of generosity. Poverty and economic despair are rising, and oftentimes it is those who have special needs, who face barriers, who are pushed aside first. Therefore, we must reaffirm even more strongly our dedication to lending a helping hand and to repair the world, tikkun olam. It is why I am so proud to be in the presence of all of you working with the Jewish Funders Network. Overcoming barriers. As I said, I'm standing here this morning because I had the benefit of a Jewish upbringing that has helped me overcome barriers and achieve my dreams. It was this spirit of chesed, of loving kindness, and the philosophy of living a life generously that my parents passed along to me that allowed me to understand that I would never let the world define me. Instead, my parents taught me to create my own definition and to create my own dreams. All I can say is, thank goodness I was born a Matlin. I was born into a family that never took no for an answer, that never let deafness stand in their way. For me and for them, it was a lot about intention and a whole lot of chutzpah. Rather than let the advice of doctors, rather than follow the advice of doctors and send me away to schools designed especially for the deaf when I was diagnosed as deaf at 18 months, my parents chose to keep me at home and send me to schools right in the neighborhood. They wanted me to have a say in how I lived my life. More importantly, they wanted to keep me close to their hearts. And that meant they sent me each day to schools right in the neighborhood because they were there each morning when I woke up and each night when I was put to bed to say I love you. That, that's not to say that growing up was easy for me because despite the fact that my family was so single-minded, sometimes I experienced frustrations and sometimes I failed. But that was all a part of growing up. For me, every day was about opening that front door and exploring the neighborhood on my own. If I couldn't explore the neighborhood on my own, how could I ever expect to explore the world on my own as an adult? So thanks to family, I grew up in a manner that was secure and challenging, enabled and respectful, and I was afforded the best of both worlds, hearing and deaf. And it's true, sometimes it was difficult, and sometimes kids could be cruel. But as a Matlin, we had answers for everything. When kids made fun of my hearing aids, my father told me to tell them they weren't hearing aids, just big globs of bubble gum. You want some? <laughs> and when kids made fun of my speech, my brothers told them, no, I had an accent because our parents were foreign spies. Yes, foreign spies. Foreign spies. In other words, my parents treated me no differently made no concessions simply because I was deaf. Well, I must admit that my parents did make one concession on my part, but one that I'm very grateful for. Right there in front of our house on Ozanam Avenue in Morton Grove in Chicago, they put up a big yellow sign that said, caution, deaf child crossing. Just to remind people to slow down when driving by because there was a deaf child playing in the neighborhood. They taught me that that sign carried another meaning. They encouraged me to see the sign as representing a sense of pride and belonging. It was my sign, and it said that you were in my neighborhood, 
It said, I'm Marley. Want to stop by and say hi? I'll be your best friend. And besides, none of the other kids had a sign of their own in the neighborhood. So what a feeling of validation that little yellow sign was. As I said earlier, my parents never felt imprisoned by the dire prognosis of the doctors and professionals in the field of deafness. Instead, they encouraged me to dream, to try to make mistakes, to be an active participant in the life of my community, whether it meant encouraging me to take up acting at seven years old, despite what others thought, a young deaf girl performing on stage, or even helping me to realize a very special dream when I was 13 years old to become bat mitzvah. My parents taught me never to give up. Way, way back in 1978, I'm sure that most people thought, how is a young girl who is deaf going to be bat mitzvah? Well, fortunately for us, just a few miles from our house was Temple B'nai Shalom of Chicago. And Temple B'nai Shalom was not your ordinary temple. It happened to be a temple serving both hearing and deaf Jewish communities. Now, how's that for Beshert? I began my studies in earnest with a rabbi who signed and spoke. And every day I worked to phonetically pronounce the Hebrew that would eventually be part of my Haftarah. And by the time my bat mitzvah day had arrived, I was ready. There I was at the altar on my day, very proud, very proud as a matlin. The rabbi was beside me, the Torah was before me. And I looked and I felt surrounded by love. My parents, my brothers, my extended family from California were there. And it made me feel very full. My heart felt very full. I still have my speech from that day and it went something like this. I am deeply proud that I am a Jewish girl because this religion is very important to me. Because it teaches us about what happened in the past to our people. Well, little did I know how important those words would be to me later that day. Because while reciting my Haftarah a few moments later, I looked out once again to my family, but instead of them smiling, they were crying. Now, I know today why they were crying, because we're Matlins. Matlins cry at the drop of a hat. I mean, we cry when the brisket comes out perfect. We cry every time. <laughs> but back then, I was too wrapped up in my Torah to understand that they were crying because their little girl was fulfilling a dream, a dream that they said would never be realized. So as soon as I saw them crying, I began crying. Now everyone in Shul was crying, oy, what a sight. <laughs> Eventually, the crying stopped. But when I looked down at my Torah, I was mortified because the tears had stained the Torah parchment. So what did I do? I started crying again. <laughs> After the service, I ran up to the rabbi and I apologized. I said, Rabbi, I'm so sorry. I ruined the Torah with my tears. Can you forgive me? As the rabbi held up my chin and wiped away my tears, he repeated the words he had just heard in my speech. He said, Marley, you have said that Jewish history is a rich one and a very important part of our present and our future. Well, in order to understand Jewish history, you must know that not only it is, is it one filled with happy moments like yours today, it is also one filled with tears. Tears for those who were persecuted, tears for those who perished. Many times it was only the stain of tears that allowed us to remember and to never forget. But, in your case, Marley, yours are tears of joy. Here, on your most important day, our Torah was stained with your tears of happiness. Most of all, Marley, your tears represent yours and your parents' dreams, your accomplishments, and your achievements as a young girl who happens to be deaf, a member of the Jewish community. I think your tears are a wonderful mitzvah. I must also touch on one other experience and one in particular 
a Jewish friend and mentor without whose encouragement I would not be standing here this morning. His name is Mr. Henry Winkler. He may have been the Fonz to the rest of the world, but to me, Henry Winkler is still the coolest, coolest Jew in the world. <laughs> One day during a show at the Center on Deafness where I had been performing songs and plays in sign language since I was seven years old, the theater company was told that the most famous person in America, Henry Winkler, more famous than even President Carter, was paying a visit to the center. Well, <laughs> after the performance, I found Henry talking with some of the actors, and with that Matlin chutzpah in my back pocket, I went right up to him and I said, hello, I'm Marley, I want to be your best friend. And then I added, and I want to be an actor in Hollywood just like you. My bags were practically packed, I was ready to go. But just as Henry was about to give me some advice, my mother, in her most well-meaning manner, took Henry aside and told him that though an encouraging word or two might be good, it might not be a good idea to encourage me too much to be an actress. Because for my mother, the reality of the situation was that any dreams that I had would only lead to disappointment. No one in Hollywood would ever understand or give a young deaf girl the chance to succeed. So why? Why would Henry ever want to instill false hopes and dreams in me. Well, as the mother of four today, I know how much she wanted to protect me, to keep me from harm. But there she was encouraging me, and there she was encouraging me and discouraging Henry. So what could I say except that's a Jewish mother for you? <laughs> well, what my mother didn't know was that Henry had his own barriers growing up and that he had just as much chutzpah as a whole room full of Matlins. Because Henry had difficulty reading in school, and in fact, his parents and his teachers thought he was slow. His parents even had a name for him, Duma Hund, dumb dog. They told him that he would never amount to anything, and it wasn't until many years later when Henry became a father and his son had the same problems that he found out his difficulty had a name, dyslexia. So all these years, Henry Winkler wasn't a Dumahund. He was simply dyslexic. But dis despite the dire predictions, Henry persevered and followed his heart and went on to achieve greatness and recognition beyond anyone's wildest dreams. So there was Henry Winkler, politely listening and nodding to my mother, probably remembering what his teachers told his parents. And when they, she was done, and my well-meaning mother was finally finished, Henry turned around, he turned around, knelt down, looked me straight in the eye, and said in his coolest, most Fonzie-like voice, Marley, sweetheart, you can be whatever you want to be. Just follow your heart, and your dreams will come true. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And eight years later, I was standing on a stage of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Hollywood with an Academy Award in my hand. Not only was it a proud moment for me and my family, it was a victory for every deaf child who had a dream and for whatever reason was told they could not achieve. Well, the moment when I should have been celebrating was soon very, very bittersweet. Because the next day after I'd won the Oscar, right there in my hotel room was an article by the columnist Rex Reed, who proclaimed that my victory the night of the Oscars was the result of a pity vote. He continued by saying that I was a deaf person in a deaf role, so how was that considered acting? And coming on the heels of New York Magazine's proclamation that I would never work in Hollywood again because, of course, what prospects would there be for a deaf actress? I was devastated. It was as if the doctors who diagnosed my deafness and my mother who tried to discourage Henry were right. Hollywood thought I was handicapped. I almost, I almost would have given up right there had it not been for two very important people. My dear grandmother Rose and Henry Winkler. Well, first, my grandmother Rose 
a woman who struggled to make a life in the United States after immigrating here from Poland, barely speaking English, was there in my hotel room the day after the Oscars, posing proudly as she could for the camera with the Oscar in her hand. She was one of the first people to discover that I was deaf and had to share the news with my parents. And I'm sure people told her what a struggle it would be for me as a child growing up deaf. Yet, there she was, standing strong and proud of me as her granddaughter. With her on my side, there was just no way I could back down to Rex Reed. But after my parents and family left, I was back again in New York City, back with my boyfriend, William Hurt. Jealousy on his part caused the relationship to eventually sour, and soon after I won the Oscar, we broke up. And I found myself alone in a big city. With nothing but the clothes on my back and Jack here, I had no choice but to get out of New York, fly to California, and look up the only real friend I had in Hollywood, Mr. Henry Winkler. And what a most auspicious day it was that I chose to move there, because as I was boarding the plane, I was informed there was a 5.9 earthquake in Los Angeles, which I guess that means something good is happening if the earth is moving. <laughs> so there I was on the doorstep of Henry and Stacy Winkler's house, and when the door opened, I shyly held out my Oscar like this. And you should have seen Henry and his wife's faces. They were beaming. Then, I mean, they were really truly beaming from ear to ear. And then Henry's expression changed. It was as if he already knew about the negative reviews and the predictions about my career. And he looked me straight in the eye. And he echoed the same words he said eight years earlier. Marley, you can be whatever you want to be. But this time he added, you're not finished yet. Not by a long shot. You have an Oscar in your hand and you're there to prove it. Then he added, you're staying for the weekend and we're going to think it over. Two years later, there was Stacy Winkler telling me to clean up my room because I was the house guest who never left. I mean, how could I leave? My own room in the guest back, in the back of the house, free rent, and the food was great. Best brisket west of Chicago. And while I was living at the Winklers, Henry reinforced the notion that the only thing a deaf person couldn't do is hear. Everything else was possible. So eventually I took that message to heart and rather than wait for things to happen, rather than hope that the offers would come in, I made things happen for myself. Just like I did when I was a kid. Every day I opened the door of Henry's house and I ventured outside. But this time I set up meetings. I met with film executives. I even formed my own production company. And just like I did when I was growing up, there were times when I had to muster up the chutzpah and come up with creative solutions in order to get out from people's preconceived notions. But this time it was not about my hearing aids or speech or that big yellow sign. This time it was being an Oscar winning actor in Hollywood who just happened to be deaf. So, just a year after I won the Academy Award, I was invited to return and present the award for Best Actor. And I was determined to do it differently. I got a new look, I got a new boyfriend, and I even decided that unlike the previous year when I signed, I would do it my way and I would speak the names of the Oscar winners. Names like Marcello Mastriani or Robin Williams. And I must have done something right because the right person Michael Douglas came up to get his Academy Award. <laughs> but, once again, just as in the previous year, people were not, willing me to, were not willing to let me be who I wanted to be. Because a very small, very vocal segment of the deaf community said that by, by speaking, I was setting an example to parents of deaf children that their children should speak and not sign. This idea could not be farther from the truth. But once again, I felt that I couldn't win for trying. Fortunately, I had one more friend and mentor who encouraged me to see barriers differently, and that was my friend Whoopi Goldberg. Because she set me straight. She recounted the story of when she decided to wear blue contact lenses for the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. They said I was just trying to be white. 
Then she added, girl, you just got to move on and do what's best for you. And no, how could I not believe her? I mean, here she is, an African-American woman with dreadlocks, blue contacts, and a Jewish name. She was every color of the rainbow. She just had to be right. <laughs> Today, it's been 25 years since Hollywood critics pronounced my career DOA, deaf on arrival. And I'm still here. As you heard, I've acted in films and in television. I've done drama and I've done comedy. I've been a lip reader on Seinfeld, a poster on the West Wing, a desperate housewife, a lawyer with a crazy client named Earl. I've even helped build a house on Extreme Makeover Home Edition for a deaf-blind family. I did it backwards and in heels while telling 25 million Americans to read my hips on Dancing with the Stars. And I even did something that no one expected me to do when I played the uh, played Jennifer Beale's love interest on the provocative Showtime drama, The L Word. And finally, earlier this year, I embarked on one of the most physically challenging and emotionally grueling pursuits of my professional career. This deaf lady proved to Donald Trump and America that I could kick some fundraising butt on Celebrity Apprentice. Mm -hmm. It was an experience that I'll never forget. Today, Times have changed. Not only have attitudes changed, but technology has evolved to where I have almost 100% access with computers and instant messaging, texting, video relay, and closed captioning. Something that I'm proud to say, by the way, that I helped get passed back in 1992 here in the United States. Now, most of the barriers that I face on a daily basis are more humorous than they are distressing. Add to that the craziness that is Hollywood, and sometimes I just have to laugh as to what happens. Once while I was working on my television series, Reasonable Doubts, with Mark Harmon, an executive from the studio came to visit the set to watch his work. And after watching me work for a few moments, he spoke to the director of the show, watching me work, saying, you know, that Marley Matlin, she's great. Is she going to be deaf for the whole show? <laughs> and once, while getting ready to appear live in front of millions of viewers on CNN, while the director, while the director counted down the moments, three, two, one, and I was getting my last look for makeup and hair, the female interviewer leaned over to Jack here and said very seriously, could you, could you tell Marley that my dog is deaf, just like her? <laughs> and just right there, the light comes on the camera. I'm live in front of millions of viewers, and I thought, what does she want me to do, woof? Does she want to throw me a bone? I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> and I have to be fair. I have to be fair. Because this kind of stuff doesn't only happen in Hollywood. Here's something that's happened actually a few times. I'm on a plane waiting to take off. The flight attendant hands me the menu, menu for dinner. She sees me signing, grabs the menu out of my hand, leaves, returns back from the galley, and gives me proudly a new menu in Braille. <laughs> in Braille. And I say to her, excuse me, ma'am, ma'am, I'm deaf, not blind. And she goes, yes, I know, you're right, yes. And I'm like, hello. And she's like, uh, oh, uh, oh. And I never see it for the rest of the flight. <laughs> Probably happened three or four times. Listen, in the end, it's not rocket science. It's, it's not rocket science. It's simple common sense. As I told Ann Landers in one of her columns, it may be true that life is challenging when you're unable to hear. But believe me when I say that the real handicap of deafness does not lie in the ear, it lies in the mind. Well, despite the barriers, all of the barriers that I faced along the way, something great happened. I got married to a wonderful man under a beautiful chuppa on Henry Winkler's front lawn. And today my husband and I have four wonderful children. Sarah, who is 16, going on 25. Brandon, who is 11. Tyler, who is nine. And Isabel, who is going to be eight in a couple of weeks. No matter what barriers we face, 
I have learned from people like my parents, from my rabbi, from friends like Henry Winkler and Whoopi Goldberg, that we must appreciate that everyone has a unique gift to share and that nothing should stand in the way of achieving one's dreams. There is a wonderful bit of Jewish folklore that I'd like to share with you and I think aptly highlights this philosophy. It's called the diamond and I'd love to share it with you. There once was a king who had a magnificent collection of jewels. He was especially in love with one great jewel in his collection, the perfect diamond. Each day, he would caress the diamond and gaze into its facets. He marveled at its perfection. One night, a tragedy occurred. As he cradled the diamond in his sleep, it fell from his hands and onto the stone floor. The king was horrified. With trembling hands, he carefully picked up the diamond and stared into its interior. And there he saw a long spindly crack running from the very top of the diamond to the very bottom. The perfect diamond was forever ruined. The king grieved over the broken jewel, and the ministers of the king brought all sorts of experts to repair the diamond, but no one could. And all seemed lost until one little craftsman offered a solution. Give me the diamond for one week, and I will bring it back more perfect than ever. Well, the king had no choice, and he handed his precious diamond to the little craftsman. When the week was over, the craftsman returned. I once again made the diamond perfect. But when the king lifted the diamond to the light, there was the long spindly crack running from the very top to the very bottom of the diamond. The king was furious. It's still broken, he roared. Look again, answered the little craftsman, and he turned the diamond over for the king. And there, at the bottom of the diamond, where the crack met the point, was a tiny little indentation. The craftsman had carved a tiny little rose. You see, said the craftsman, now instead of a long spindly crack, the diamond has the most exquisite rose, with a long magnificent stem running from the very top to the very bottom. Now it is not only repaired, but in truth it is more unique, more remarkable, and more perfect than before. It's a wonderful Jewish story. Every single one of us has the ability to help other Jews less fortunate than ourselves to bloom into beautiful roses, just as my parents did for me. It is Kalal Yisrael, the responsibility each Jew has for one another. As ones who give, we can help Jews everywhere to become one. Remember that we must always listen to the heart of our children. I certainly have listened and learned from mine. And in the end, though the world may think that I live in a world of silence, silence is the last thing the world will ever hear from me. And I trust and I know the same is true for you. Thank you so very much. It's not Hanukkah, Marley said yet. No, <laughs> just wanted to say thank you so much for being here from the Rudiman family. Thank you so very much. Thank you, and happy Hanukkah, by the way, in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Marley. I have a brief update to the program. Our next scheduled speaker, Professor Michael Stein, had a brief health issue that unfortunately has prevented him from joining us today. He's fine, and we were working to schedule an opportunity to learn from him early next year. In his stead, we are honored to have Matan Karch, a graduate of Harvard Law School, Matan was recently nominated by President Obama to serve on the National Council on Disability. 
He has been active in the disability rights movement as vice chair of the New Haven Commission on Disabilities and chair of its Americans with Disabilities Act subcommittee. As a member of the Union for Reform Judaism Department of Jewish Family Concerns Disability Task Force and its special needs com camping committee and of course now on the National Council. He also finds time to serve as associate at the law, law firm Kramer Levine here in New York. Please welcome with me Matan Coach. Everyone mind if I speak from right here? I think it's more centrally located, and I don't really need the podium, so uh, that would work better for me. Uh, good morning. As mentioned, I'm not Michael Stein. Uh, although he's a friend of mine, I like him very much, but uh, not he. So I'm not going to try to speak to you on Michael's topic, because frankly, I don't know how well I could speak on Michael's topic if you'd be sitting here listening to me talk about something about which I know very little. So I'm going to speak instead on an issue that while I'm presenting to you my own views and not those of the National Council on Disability is central to uh, our current set of priorities and, and that is um, employment of people with disabilities really from a sense of how one might look at it and because we're at a funders conference I thought I'd speak for a minute on the types of programs that might help. I don't have any specific programs to endorse. A, I'm federally prohibited from doing so, and B, I, I just don't have any. But these are ideas that you might look for uh, and ways uh, that might be promoted. So a little bit about me. You got a couple of the highlights in that lovely introduction, but uh, I uh, went to Yale College and then to the Harvard Law School and was hired out of the Harvard Law School to work in the council's office of Procter & Gamble, which was uh, my first role. And quite honestly, Procter & Gamble, when they hired me, was looking for an Ivy League lawyer. In fact, you know, it seemed like every year for the first couple of years I was there, the question was posed to me, how do we increase our Harvard recruitment? It wasn't, how do we increase our recruitment of people with disabilities. And so with that perspective, uh, really they uh, looked at my accommodations from what you'd call uh, that perspective, which is to say all of my accommodations were focused not first and foremost on what does the law require or what do we think in some abstract sense might incorporate you know, a lawyer in a wheelchair into our legal department, but sort of the really practical question of how do we make it so that Matan is the best functioning lawyer that he can be, sort of the best investment for our legal department, for, you know, to look at it in a very practical business sense. That was great. And really that same question, that same approach would happen in my next employee at Kramer 11 when I decided that P&G was great, but it was time for me to come from the Midwest back to the East Coast, and I, uh, you know, came to work at the law firm of Kramer 11. Again, the question wasn't, what do we have to provide? What does the law say? You know, reasonable accommodation is, you know, under what regulation do we have to provide X, Y, or Z? The question was, what would be, will be necessary to help Matan succeed here, and how do we make that happen. And, you know, it was made very explicit to me that no reasonableness analysis under the law was going to be performed when I requested an accommodation. The simple uh, question was going to be, uh, will this help? Can we do it? I mean, I guess if they were ever thinking to deny an accommodation, then the legal analysis might have had to come in. But thankfully, that has never come up. So uh, hopefully we'll Never have to explore that question. Um, and that has really informed, had informed my ideas about employing 
people with disabilities. And I'm pleased to learn that it's informed ideas more broadly. And that this is not just the experience of my life, but is in fact the experience um, in the business world. And I'm modifying now some remarks that I gave at Yale Law School last year, so pardon me if they're a little academic in character. I've modified them as best I can for a different audience. Uh, but so basically, P&G, one reason that people like to employ people with disabilities, other than the sort of Ivy League lawyer phenomenon that I present, is tapping the consumer with a disability. And in fact, when I served on P&G's People with Disabilities Global Leadership Network, which uh, is something you can find in my bio, random, uh, fun, exciting work, uh, the big focus was, in fact, that we should increase company representation of people with disabilities because this would help us to tap into the market of consumers with disabilities. It was a very practical, you know, I, I think uh, that that was made reference to by a prior speaker, the sort of practical tapping in. And other companies have done this with extraordinary success, often by accident. So I'll tell a case study story of a SunTrust Bank um, who quite without plan had uh, hired a deaf person into one of their local branches sometime back in the 80s before you know, this was at the top of everyone's, uh, everyone's radar screen. And they found that deaf people within the community were coming to that bank branch and were choosing that bank branch because that employee could interact with them. It was that simple. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't a recruitment program. It wasn't a massive marketing campaign. It was just this simple learning that by bringing this person in, uh, they had tapped business of a market that they had never tapped before. The case study goes on to explain to us that they learned this lesson, they internalized it for their entire corporate market, they set up an award structure for people who found ways to tap the business of their affinity group, of their minority group, of their disability group, whoever it was with the notion that by increasing their diversity, they increased their market share. In essence, they have become a shiny example of employing people with disabilities without ever saying, gee, we think it's a good idea to employ just people with disabilities because we think that's a nice thing to do. It was entirely, gee, it's good business for us to employ people with disabilities. And frankly, I like to think that P&G operates in the same fashion. So that, I think, is one bucket of the model that people use, why hire people with disabilities. A second bucket that I have found is the one exemplified by my story. So it's the, we want talent that we otherwise, you know, we want to tap the talent of people with disabilities, and perhaps by doing so, gain talent that would not otherwise be available to us. And so my example might seem a little, little idiosyncratic. I mean, to say that we should go out and find all of the Harvard lawyers with disabilities is a fantastic idea and will employ you know, some very small number of people. But it again works on a broad scale. And I think the most telling example in the book, in the case studies, was a small uh, wood manufacturing company in, I want to say, Minnesota. And this small company in Minnesota had, you know, was simply experiencing a labor shortage of the kind of labor that they needed. They needed reliable people, they needed hardworking people, they needed dedicated people, and they found that in the, in the um, sector that they were in, this was hard to come by. And they were approached by what I assume, although the book is not explicit, was a vocational rehabilitation counselor, uh, who said, I have someone who I, I think could be very good here. Uh, they'll need certain accommodations to work. And in the course of that discussion, and this I think is important message too, it was decided not to hire that person. So important caveat, it's not always going to be the right person that comes to your door. But, but, the, but they expressed openness, they expressed interest, and so the same voc rehab worker 
came back at a later time with somebody else. And this person absolutely needed a little bit of extra training, a little bit, uh, you know, a few what looked to be from the case study virtually costless or, or one-time cost accommodations. And this person has become one of their most uh, reliable employees in a job that previously had high turnover. They learn from this, and according to the case study of the 20 employees of this small company, seven of them are now people with disabilities. Again, not because anyone set out and said, we think employing people with disabilities is good, but because after that experience with the first employer, employee, they realized, number one, that they should be open to the idea that they could get the wonderful employees that they needed by tapping the talent pool with disabilities, and uh, two, that in some ways, because as the studies show, people with disabilities that find a good fit in their job are less likely to move from that job because finding a good fit isn't always as easy. They again found that if they could provide that good fit, if they could provide good work in a good environment, they were much more likely to have a stable staff. Now again, I promised that I would take this to the bigger picture and take this to the lessons that we learned. Give me a moment to re-access my notes because iPads lock a little too quickly. And so the question is, what can we learn from this? What, what can you do? And I think the first is um, get the word out. I mean, I think that A, probably it's still not widely known that this is a model for employing people with disabilities, that in fact it can be good for your business, not good, just good to do. Other things that seem to be persistent misconceptions worth getting the word out is that it's usually not terribly expensive to accommodate a person with a disability. Again, I'm not saying that off the top of my head, studies have been done. Uh, the vast majority of requested um, accommodations are costless. And among those with cost, uh, up to 70% are a one-time cost of $500 or less, uh, according to a broad-ranging national survey of these things. So again, the first thing to do is really get the knowledge out. It's not really a tzedakah thing to hire people with disabilities, it's good for your business. It's a, they're, they're good talent, you can make it work on the balance sheet, and by the way, it is sort of still a good thing to do. Um, the next, honestly, is to help develop the skills of people with disabilities. I made passing reference to vocational rehabilitation, and I will say that without Connecticut Vocational Rehabilitation, which is a state program that supported me through college and law school providing uh, the care that I required uh, to go through. I wouldn't be able to do what I do. I wouldn't have the education that I do. Certainly my parents could not independently afford um, to uh, do that. And of course, uh, government programs are wonderful, but they are uh, both underfunded and simply not large enough in scope to serve the needs of everyone that might develop their skills. And so one uh, important place, I, I think, for programmatic work are various other innovative and effective programs to help people with disabilities develop their skills, again, to become that desired commodity. Because a person with disabilities who doesn't have the skills isn't a desired commodity. You know, they, they can't uh, contribute to your business. And surprisingly, whether you have a disability or not, most people aren't born with marketable skills. They have to be picked up somewhere. Or so. You know, let, let's uh, work on how we uh, could get that to be done. And then the second piece, which I'm sure will be the topic of many talks today, so I won't dwell, is to you know, help people with disabilities to live in the community, which is to say, you really can't work un unless you're first living in the community. You really can't work unless you can first get up for work. You really can't work unless you can first get to work and get home from work and interact with your uh, co-workers, both in and out of the office. I mean, th there's sort of a whole 
a whole enterprise that goes into getting an individual to work before they ever set foot or wheel or whatever you will inside the door of their workplace, uh, you know, and while it's not the main focus of my talk, <laughs> it is a critical, critical element, you know, to, to improve uh, the workforce and to get people out there. And then the last, to be honest, is, is what I call matching. And it's sort of along there with getting the work out, which is to say, I am lucky. I'm lucky that first I encountered a very uh, forward-thinking uh, Fortune 20 company where uh, one of my college friends had gone directly into marketing and so I knew they were forward-thinking and I was able to uh, get my application to them and they said, gee, we want him, that's exciting. Uh, by the time I came to Kramer, Kramer 11, I was already an accomplished lawyer. I had been a client. Again, I was fortunate. Uh, didn't need to make any initial connections. They'd already sort of professionally been made for me. But for so many people, that first connection is the critical piece. The company that is looking to fill a need that could be well filled by an individual with a disability, the individual with the disability that has that unique skill and would be such a good hire for that company, you know, to put it sort of in a cultural context, it's all in the shidduch, right? You know, it, it's all about, uh, you know, fixing the two up, else never the twain shall meet. So, you know, to me, those three buckets, the development of skills, the, um, the um, mixing of folks in the sort of all-encompassing living in the community are, are key areas where, uh, you know, where philanthropy and the philanthropic sector can really get involved to promote this. But I don't want to leave the stage without talking about one other critical and oft overlooked element, which is that uh, presumably in addition to being philanthropies, all of your organizations are in fact businesses. They all employ people, they all have offices, they all have needs, they all have skill sets. And so it's important as we talk about these good ideas and these good things and these things that we would like to foster in the community that the first look be right at our front door. Do we have an opening? And does that opening something that perhaps, A, we've had trouble filling from the general talent pool and maybe a, a creative way to do it is to look at some of these recruitment channels, is to look at voc rehab, is to look at, um, you know, colleges that are doing career fairs, but specifically say, we think we could be a good fit for a person with a disability. I guarantee you, most college career offices have a good sense of who their graduating students with disabilities are, because if they're anything like me, they've been in a couple hundred times, you know, hoping that, they, that uh, the right opportunity or, or the right option will uh, come their way. And so, you know, before we talk about programs that can be funded and, and movements and ideas, you know, it can start right at home. You know, it's, each job, of course, is a drop in the overall employment bucket, but it's a rather significant change for the individual that gets it. And more importantly, if my life experience is any judge, it starts people along the path. You know, entry-level positions are fantastic because they give a resume, they give a way forward. It doesn't have to be a glamour job. A job is so important. Now, that's about the end of my prepared remarks. I was told I had a relatively short window in which to speak. I don't know if we've reached it, but I'm perfectly willing to take questions if we are still within available time. And for that, I turn to whomever is moderating to let me know. Okay, any questions? Okay. Absolute uh, quiet on the part of the audience. That's got to be a first. But uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matan. And I'd, I'd like us to recognize all the other speakers who've uh, spoken to us today. It's been a terrific morning, hasn't it, so far? Yeah, I know I Looks like the Kleenex uh, went unused. 
Oh, oh, it has been, no, sorry. It, it, whatever, it doesn't matter. And the other good news is we're only 15 minutes behind schedule, and that's really quite an accomplishment. So uh, I, I just want to give you a, a little update as a result of that. Um, there'll be a brief break before our first breakout sessions. And um, the breakout sessions will be from 11.15 to 12.30. So, and that's great, because I have to say the speeches were all worth it. You know, and so, um, so we'll, we'll have a breakout session beginning at 11.15. They'll run to 12.30, so lunch will begin after that. And so it's only a 15-minute difference, and, you know, among friends, not a, not a big deal. We have uh, snacks and coffee in the hallway outside. And so we'll see you at the breakout sessions beginning at 11.15 and at lunch around 12.30.